sitting here with Gavin Froome, one of the treasures of Vancouver, I would say, music, arts, film, design. Uh, how are you? I'm great. Good to see you again. And you. We uh, know each other from many years ago when we were on, I was on Coast State, uh, 81040, and you were in a band called Pull, which had quite a bit of success, and you guys toured across Canada, and you were really the media darling. Um, I remember we had a huge night one night, and Pull actually headlined the whole uh, Coast Radio Extravaganza night. And then you branched off, and here you are now. Here I am now, all these years later, yeah. yeah. So what primarily now are you? I am kind of, uh, I am excited about a lot of things. And I'm curious about a lot of things, and I want to try a lot of things, and I'm easily distracted. So I do a lot of different things, and I don't know if I'm particularly really good at any single one, but they all kind of inform each other. So when it comes to music um, and production, that's something I, I that's, that's where my heart is for sure. But visual design and art direction, the way things look, aesthetics, uh, architecture, um, I care about all of that stuff. And over the years, I've kind of navigated these worlds where, you know, once I was uh, in a rock band, and then fell in love with electronic music at the when that was really coming into its own and learned how to make that um, and then toured with that and, and, and made that my thing but then also found I needed to do other things because sometimes when you're doing one thing you can get stagnant and uh, uh, writer's block or the pressure of having to deliver something that's purely creative I found very difficult at times how do you know when you're sitting here what you want to do from day to day? What, what's your creative process? It's um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I kind of feel like having a woodshed, like a, where you can just chip away and, and stay busy and productive when it's pouring for, for days on end. Um, I love that idea and I look forward to the fall. Like having a summer in on the West Coast is incredible. I want to be outside as much as I can. And then as soon as the fall hits, it's like cardigans and good coffee and uh, whiskey and fireside stuff and then working in, in the studio on, on creating things. How I got into film after I, I was in music uh, was kind of an organic, um, uh, it was an organic um, transition. I, I had been touring and gigging a lot and uh, was feeling like a little bit like a little burnt out of the club life. Like when, you, when you're when you a producer that makes records and you get invited to play at clubs or warehouses or festivals, there's a lot of traveling, there's a lot of um, alone time, there's a lot of um, time with strangers. Like when, you, when a promoter brings you to LA to play at a warehouse and you, you don't play until four in the morning, that's a lot of time you got to spend with, with these strangers and that, there can be some amazing times but I was at a time in, a, in my life where I was kind of over that a little bit. I wanted to have a little bit more security and, and settle down a bit, bit more um, and kind of build this home that I've been doing with my wife. Not this home but build, build, a, build a home mm -hmm. um, and be a little bit less sort of in the wind and like cash rich one month and then broke the next because bookings change or, or who knows what. Um, I was really into visual design at that time, and if you look back at one of my, my first full-length album on Nordic Tracks, Mobile Villager, um, it was all about this idea of living in the city and keeping dry and having a great coat and some headphones, and it was when, like, you know, cross trainers were really big and, yeah. and that idea, but there's a song on that 99, album. 99. Right? 99, back in 99, and there's a song on that album called Architect. And it was because the guy, Vince Cook, who does all the graphics for the, for the label, he trained as an architect, but he got into a bunch of other stuff instead. But I was always exposed to this idea of architecture and design. So I was really kind of fascinated with that. And it's interesting to see that I went through these different uh, phases of music and then got into film. And it was the same reason I got into film as what I got into music. When I got into music, I was in a band and there was the structure of the record labels, the corporations, the advances. a and ex expensive studios. You know what I mean? When a band gets signed, they get an advance, and you think, wow, we've made it, but you, yeah. you basically got a loan. Yeah, and then, you, exactly, and then yeah. you're paying for everything for the rest of your careers. Totally, <laughs> and, and at that time, like, dance music was kicking off, and house and techno was really becoming a thing, and hip-hop, and sampling technology enabled 
um, people to get into it without a great barrier. Right. So you could go to a music store at, at the time and buy a sampler or a drum machine or a synthesizer mm -hmm. and get hook it up to a sequencer or even a computer if you had a computer and you could figure out how to make this music. So it was kind of like the bedroom DJ, the bedroom producer was born right. and that was really exciting. So that allowed me to take control of my musical desires and uh, and uh, and, my, and my focus and, and do it whenever I wanted to do it. I wasn't stuck to being in a band with a record label with these schedules and trying to n navigate that world I could do it for I really love music and I think music's one of the best things you can be involved with and MIDI technology in the in the 90s um, really allowed me to do that and a whole you know generation of producers was born right when did you know you wanted to do a film and make that exactly well, it was interesting because at that time, it was actually I had a, my last sort of official booking at that time was in Los Angeles um, at an after hours party in a, in, in a warehouse downtown. And I had a day off the next day and I had understood that at that point, architecture was really, really something that can be quite powerful. And I, I, I knew there was an architect in Los Angeles, Richard Neutra, and his son Dion, who was in his 80s at the time, there he was still practicing and I, I kind of looked him up and uh, got this idea and uh, about f architecture, film technology, like it had, like technology for music had changed in the 90s, film technology had changed in the 2000s. So there, were, there was high speed internet, there was Vimeo, there was DSLR cameras that could shoot beautiful things. So it's kind of like the same scenario 10 years earlier where you could buy a few pieces of accessible gear mm -hmm. and go and make something really good. Right. And I reconnected with a friend of mine uh, who had been doing some documentary work, Mike Bernard, and floated the idea of this Vancouver, Los Angeles, Neutra connection, which there was. And he was connected to architecture. His great uncle was Ned Pratt, wow. who was like the, the dawn of Vancouver modernism yeah. back in the 40s and 50s and so on. And we Without just, knowing it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and we just got so excited about this thing. And we loaded up our backpacks, filled it with smoked salmon and you know ice wine, and went down to hang out with all these eighty-year-old architects. Some friends with the ice wine and the salmon for sure. <laughs> yeah. You show up to anyone's house with some some wild salmon and some ice wine, <laughs> the doors will open. That's good. So working with uh, singers, right? Uh, melody comes from vocalists a lot of the time, and therefore your songs become actual songs, not just grooves, not sort of um, throw your hands up in the air and dance around but you're, you're actually getting into a, a tighter sort of melody. Is that fair to say? Or I'm not trying to yeah. take away from what you've done previously. I'm just saying that you're honing it in more on the melody, right? Yeah, and I think the, the beauty and the power of a good lyric is that it's generic enough, uh, but specific enough that everyone can relate to it. And I, I really am interested in that idea. Um, for so long, you know, I'd be making these records and EPs, like these three or four song EPs, that ultimately were DJ tools. So, you know, I remember the first time I heard Fly Me to Brazil, which was off, I don't know, the third or fourth EP I did for Nordic Tracks. I heard hearing that in the club for the first time. It blew my mind. The dance floor went crazy. Luke was spinning it, and I was on the floor partying and having a good time. And it was just so exciting and exhilarating to hear your production really do what it's supposed to do on a dance floor. And that was one of the biggest tracks for me at the time. And uh, But Luke's up on stage. Luke, the owner of Luke, Nordic Tracks. God bless Luke. But he, yes. being the, the, the label guy and the DJ of that gig that night, it's like the praise, it's like you're almost anonymous with be, being a, a producer of Deep House Music. And you know, maybe that's okay. I didn't really get into it to become like a household name or to be a brand or to you know to be a star. It was more like I was really excited by the music, I was really excited by the technology, and then I was I found myself doing it. Tell me about the creative process and for anyone out there who might want to become an artist and how you got into it. But you know, we were talking about your creative process, but prior to doing all of what you've done, how do you know that you want to do it or when did you know is there some inspiration that came to you that you can share with others? For music? Just to become an artist, to go for it. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's like the chemical makeup of my brain, but I'm really excited to, to, to be here. Um, I, there's, there's so many possibilities. Like if you uh, have your health 
and you live in a place where you're not oppressed or uh, you've got choices, then you should do whatever you can. Whatever, do whatever makes you happy ultimately. But I just love the idea that you can take, make something from nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, like my mom always says, you can make music with pots and pans. Like if I, when I was younger, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna buy a new keyboard. It's gonna be, it's kind of a lot of money. And she's like, oh, don't be silly. Just you can make music with pots and pans. And I was like, well, I'm not Matthew Herbert for one. But yes, you can make music with pots and pans. But um, I don't know. I just think there are more than eight hours in a day. And uh, like people will say, how did you make a film when you're doing design work and you're making music and now you have a kid and you have a house? Like, how, where, where, where does the time come from? And it's like, you know, the hours after 8 p.m. to midnight. Most people check out and they watch TV or Netflix or whatever. That's when you get busy. So something I've learned from Wayne Gann, who's a potter, friend of mine, um, he, he believes that everybody has a gift. Um, and I believe that too. I think everyone is going to be good at something, whether it's making music, or serving people, or building houses, or everyone's got a gift. The way our society is structured puts a lot of pressure on trying to determine what that is. After high school, it's university or college, you make up your mind, take a year off, you know, you're playing with your future. What it, people aren't really allowed to, the time to find that gift. And I think that um, if you just try things um, and try and figure out what you love, Find out what you love and try and contribute to the world. Um, there's so much bad news in the world um, and it's overwhelming sometimes to say, how, how can I help? How can I fix this? How can I make the world better? And um, yeah, social media is powerful, the internet is powerful, information is powerful, but I think if you contribute to the arts, to culture, you're ultimately fighting the negativity in the world by putting something beautiful up into the world. So I like the idea that my records are, you know, some of them are big in Japan, some of them are in, co in collector's shelves, some are in the bargain basement in California. But I've, co I've contributed and I keep contributing to culture and to the world in a, in a positive way. And I, I think uh, the older I get, the more I realize that that is the, it's a wonderful thing to do, to be involved with music to be involved with film or art or painting or anything that's creative or beautiful uh, is worthwhile. That's Wendy Biscuit. That's Tim Hersey. We're biscuits and gravy. 
Uh, we've been working together for approximately a year and we love every minute of it. It's an all original creative project. We're both based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Been playing professionally as musicians for a number of years and uh, just recently decided to take on the project of performing 100% original music and uh, it's been quite a journey. You caught us today in the Rio Theater and we're working with Cecil English who's shooting some video for us to uh, basically put together some live performances for uh, festival applications for the 2017 uh, season. And uh, musically we've, we're we're always writing, uh, yeah, always. We, I mean, that, that's the foundation of our project, is that we're constantly producing new music. Uh, it's, it's not a stagnant What do we group. got, four no. now? We have five. Five, five brand five new, new ones pieces. that are going to go on the next CD, which, I mean, uh, there's no reason why we can't. Spring? Spring, yeah. Last September, we wrote our first song, and it's actually very difficult to find someone to have a creative connection with. And when we both discovered that we were able to feel very comfortable to join forces and our creative energies together, we really haven't looked back. And it's our primary focus now with both of our musical careers to move forward and inspire other people to bring creative music as well. Creative anything, really, because creative energy is such a beautiful thing and I feel that it's very understated and underrated um, and if you only take the risk to bring it out of your living room and share it with other people you can talk any time now Tim just you have you haven't seen my living room I was just thinking what you're saying about the creative creative processes that's uh, so many situations and people that <clears throat> cramp creativity and and it, it's just really nice to find somebody who's tuned into the creative process as, as well. Yeah. Well, and encouraging you know how I love it. To say nice things I about know it. you do, Tim. But to encourage each other and to encourage others, really, to feel safe enough to make themselves vulnerable to um, produce artwork in any form that it manifests. It's the essential dynamic is, you know, that what exists between, you know, when a, when a band sounds good, it, it's because all the people in that band connect with each other. People are coming to hear Tim play guitar. They're not coming to hear me play guitar. Uh, so he, what he, he's teaching me tricks of the trade, uh, small details that make a huge difference on stage and as a performer. And uh, it just feels so wonderful to have... Um, have it be a team more than a band with hired musicians behind you that uh, we're both equally pushing forward with 50 percent, maybe 60 percent. <laughs> <laughs> he was here so I don't, know, I don't know what does the contract say. <laughs> I immigrated from England in 1966 and it was, that's kind of an interesting time in musical history from, you know, the British invasion and everything. So there was, from the beginning, I, I was immersed in music and what was happening because we lived in London and, and I moved here from London to Montreal from London. And then uh, my mom moved from the UK to New York City, which was another, you know, hotbed of music and, and uh, just the influences of that whole time, you know, and Jimi Hendrix was happening, and there was just so much fantastic music, and and that that kind of was the the basis of what drew, you know, you know, I saw Keith Richards and and Jimi Hendrix, and I went, I gotta have that. In '75, I started playing professionally, and personally, I'm proud to say that I have made hundreds and hundreds of dollars. <laughs> we got the groove and we got the groove and grooving. We got the groove and we got the groove and grooving. We got the groove and get your body moving, grooving. We got the groove and we got the groove and grooving. We 
Funky nasty. Funky nasty. 